Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today. We are thrilled to have you at the Winter Ready Extreme Cold Summit. And I am Victoria Salinas. I am the senior official performing the duties of Deputy Administrator for Resilience here at FEMA. And I'm going to kick it. I'll be our moderator today, but I wanted to start with a little bit of housekeeping. Today's session uh, will be recorded so that we can make sure to share the rich information shared and the dialogue with others afterwards. So please, please be aware it'll be posted on FEMA's YouTube channel and be sent out with a uh, email that includes all the great resources that'll be discussed today. If you are looking for American Sign Language, it is available. Attendees should just click on the interpretation button at the bottom of the screen and select the American Sign Language option. And this today is part of a, a series. The summit will include uh, two roundtables today where there will be question and answer. And we encourage each of you to reach out afterwards to the speakers. Media may be attending as well. And we ask that if there are media inquiries that you please send it to the FEMA news desk. And like I mentioned, Victoria Salinas here, thrilled to have you joining us. We have a great agenda in store. We will be hearing from leaders from across the federal interagency, as well as state, local, and tribal leaders. We're going to be discussing resources, best practices, and success stories of communities taking action to reduce the risk of extreme cold. You have Two special speakers at the top of our hour will be joined first by our Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas, the Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security, and then by Administrator Criswell for the Federal Emergency Management Agency. And so once again, thank you so much for, for joining us. And it is my true pleasure and honor to, to introduce you to the Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security. Not only is he truly an incredible civil servant and leader, but if you've had a chance to have any conversation with Secretary Mayorkas, he is just an incredible human. And this is the second time we are having a summit that it focuses on extreme temperature in the summer, it was on extreme heat. Now it's on extreme cold. And, and he and the administrator have really prior, prioritized this because it causes so much unnecessary human suffering. And so thank you for joining us. And without further ado, Secretary Mayorkas. Uh, Victoria, thank you so much for the too kind introduction. And thank you so much for your superb uh, work on behalf of people across this country. Uh, thanks uh, to all of you for giving me a few minutes uh, to share some thoughts with you. In Cook County, Texas, the historical average low temperature in January is 40 degrees. Last Wednesday, it never got above 23 degrees, and it dropped down to 9 degrees overnight. This meant that a number of local families whose homes did not have the central hearing, heating, or insulation necessary to withstand such an unusual cold front were forced to rely on space heaters to stay warm. Electric heaters are useful, but they can be very dangerous when used improperly. Space heaters are involved in more than a thousand home fires across the country every year and factor into the vast majority of home heating related deaths. Last Wednesday, a Cook County family of eight was using such a heater to get through the night in their otherwise unheated home. Shortly after 3 a.m., it sparked a bedroom fire, taking the life of their seven-year-old daughter. She was one of 95 Americans killed by the effects of extreme cold just last week. From Tennessee, where a patient in an ambulance and the driver of a pickup truck were both killed, when the truck skidded out on black ice. To Illinois, where a man froze to death inside his unheated home. To Oregon, where a tree branch weakened by ice and wind took down a power line and killed three people. Extreme cold can be relative. In Chicago, it might mean sub-zero temperatures and a wind chill 40 degrees below zero, as that city experienced last Tuesday. In Cook County, Texas, 23 degrees was extreme. That makes extreme cold a potential threat to the safety and security of every American everywhere. One that demands the same urgency 
collaboration and commitment that government has brought to extreme weather events like hurricanes, heat waves, and other events exacerbated by climate change. That is why we, at the Department of Homeland Security and FEMA, launched the hashtag Winter Ready Public Safety Awareness Campaign, and that is why we have convened all of you, federal, state, local, tribal, and territorial leaders, emergency managers, and nonprofit administrators for the hashtag Winter Ready Extreme Cold Summit. The DHS workforce, including FEMA and its great administrator, Deanne Criswell, from whom you're going to hear in a few minutes, and our partners across the Biden-Harris administration will continue to be there not only in your community's moments of need, but well before then too, as we work together to prevent grave harm from ever occurring. We are here today to help streamline communication and coordination to help cut through red tape and to get resilience resources out to every community that needs them. These resources range from our hazard mitigation assistance program, uh, programs including flood mitigation assistance funds and building resilient infrastructure and communities or BRIC grants, which help fund climate smart construction projects, warming centers, backup generators and more to our hashtag Winter Ready Partner Toolkit, which provides individuals and communities with free tips on how to keep homes warm, travel safely, and prevent heating-related fires and carbon monoxide poisoning. Just as important, this summit is an opportunity for each of us to connect with and learn from one another. The lessons learned in Dallas or Buffalo today may prove valuable in Atlanta or Seattle tomorrow. Homeland security is fundamentally an exercise in partnerships. And when it comes to extreme cold, the impact of our work together can be measured in lives saved. Thank you all so very much for taking the time to join us today. I'm grateful for your partnership, for your commi continued commitment to ensuring the safety and resilience of our communities. I hope you find the summit enriching and enjoyable. Thanks so much. Great, thank you so much, Secretary Mayorkas. And now over to Deanne Criswell. Thanks, Victoria. And first, I just wanna have a big thank you to Secretary Mayorkas for being with us today. Uh, I, as well as all of FEMA, we so appreciate your leadership and your continued willingness to help make extreme weather a priority for the department um, and for all of our federal partners. We at FEMA, we are proud to partner with DHS to help convene these voices from across the federal family and all levels of government to help us mobilize around this really important issue. Um, you've heard some of the comments from Secretary Marcus, and I just want to give you a few more. Like, last August, as much of our nation really sweltered through unprecedented heat waves, many of us gathered for FEMA's first extreme heat summit. We came together to discuss ways to mitigate the dire impacts of extreme heat on our planet, on our communities, as well as all of us who are here. And it is my hope that we will bring the same sense of drive and urgency to today's conversation about extreme climate. Every year, our climate reaches new, seemingly unimaginable extremes. In fact, in 2023, it was just confirmed as the hottest year on record. And as our world grows hotter and hotter, we tend to neglect discussing the other end of the temperature spectrum, extreme cold. Much like extreme heat, extreme cold can be a silent killer, impacting everything from our health to our livelihoods. Just a few weeks ago, freezing temperatures impacted more than 41 million people across the United States. Iowa voters, they experienced the coldest caucus day on record. Football fans in the Northeast and the Midwest attended some of the coldest NFL games of all time. Dozens were hospitalized with hypothermia. These recent 
to say fronts, these are not random occurrences. In December of 2022, a once in a generation snowstorm buried Buffalo, New York, where we recently shot a winter safety PSA with the Buffalo Village. Further south, more than 260,000 Texans were left without power during last year's ice storm. And the 2021 Great Texas Freeze left 10 million people without power across the state and caused a deadly 100 vehicle pileup in Fort Worth. And just a few years ago, right here in the capital region, hundreds of drivers were stranded in freezing temperatures for more than 24 hours on the highway during a sudden snowstorm. So no matter where you live, extreme winter weather poses a very real threat to our lives. And that is why prioritizing climate resilience is so incredibly important. In November, we launched FEMA's Winter Ready Campaign with a simple goal to encourage individuals, to encourage households and communities to identify and reduce the risk that they face during the winter season. As an agency, our aim is always to meet communities where they are. In this campaign, it's no different, which is why we have focused on creating and disseminating accessible and affordable winter preparedness tips. We even created a Winter Ready Partners Toolkit, which provides critical information sharing resources for leaders who want to educate communities and help promote public safety. And when communities are ready to mitigate their risks, as you heard from the secretary, we have hazard mitigation assistance grants that are available to help them build their resilience. This includes support for community resilience funds, which provide temperature controlled environments to protect our most at risk brain humans. You can learn more about all of these funding opportunities through different webinars that we host on FEMA.gov. And I highly recommend these. if you don't understand them or you don't know what's available, that we check these webinars out. This, this is just a sampling of the ideas and the tools that are available to you today. All of the resources that you are going to hear about today center around one common thing, that being winter ready will help you save lives. We have to work together to make sure communities know their risks and that they are prepared before the disaster strikes. Readiness, resilience, and preparedness, these are the key to keeping people safe. In today's ever-evolving, seemingly 24-7 disaster cycle, we need a new doctrine for emergency management. And this is why we at FEMA have made 2024 our year of resilience. Our goal is to stop the respond, recover, rinse, and repeat cycle. And that means investing in resilience, understanding risk down to the individual level, and ensuring communities know what resources are out there to help them meet the threats of tomorrow today. I urge all of you to join us in our efforts to build a stronger, safer, and more prepared nation for the future. This, this is an all, all hands on deck moment. And especially because we know that this type of work, it pays off. From Colorado to North Carolina, States have taken public safety into their own hands by declaring states of emergency ahead of the most recent big winter storm. We saw states operationalize their National Guard and their operations centers. They put travel bans in place and they used emergency communication. This forward thinking, it saved lives and it underscores the importance of not only knowing our risks, but investing in our state, local, tribal, and territorial partners as well. So in closing, I know that in this age of increasingly severe weather events, it can be easy to perhaps feel helpless or that the threat landscape is just too much to handle. But it's important to remember that we have access to the tools we need to make our community better prepared for whatever comes their way. So as you go through today's summit, I want you to listen and learn and share with each other participate in panels, and take what our speakers share to heart. We all have so much to offer. We all have so much to learn to make sure our communities are winter ready. So I look forward to working with each and every one of you as we strive toward our goal, a safer, 
more resilient world for all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Administrator Chris Well. That was phenomenal. And thank you to Secretary Mayorkas as well. First off, just additional gratitude for everything you are both doing every single day for the American people, and particularly in this season of extreme cold. Again, I'd like to thank our audience for being what's here today and for the panelists for taking time to, to share their wisdom. We have a great lineup for you that includes representatives from state, tribes, local governments, federal agencies, and really looking forward to hearing your ideas. So when we last met, as I was saying at the beginning of the call, at our last weather-related summit, it was about extreme heat. And we, we see that with the impacts of climate change, we're dealing with extreme temperatures in so many new ways. Just recently, 44 million people in the United States were dealing with winter weather advisories, according to the National Weather Service. There was wind chill affecting more than 29 million people with those types of advisories and 64 million were, were had uh, storm warnings in, in effect. The fact is that this is happening all over our nation from the deep south to the most northern states are having to deal with these extreme temperatures and weather related threats. And it's something we're having to prepare for in new ways. Many of us have also had our own personal experiences with extreme temperatures and extreme winter. Many of you, uh, if you joined our, 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 our Summer Ready campaign, will recall that I shared my own experience with my mothers in Texas, where they were dealing with the blackouts from, from the extreme cold a couple years back. The next year they were dealing with extreme drought. And so one of those things that I myself have started to do is download the FEMA app to know what the weather forecast is, where, where my loved ones are so that I can be checking in on my parents who are seniors more regularly. We're also starting to see, I have a colleague who's who didn't know his father was had his heat out when we had the recent cold snap here in the DC area and went to go visit his father and it was 40, 30 degrees in his father's home. Technology solves some of these things. And Nest Thermostat, you can know what time or another kind of smart way to know what the temperature is. We can, we can take care of our older parents in, in new ways, thanks to advances in technology. And, and so there's constantly things we can be doing to, to help. And that's really what today is about. And we also are, one of the things I wanted to highlight before we dive into today's panel conversations is that there's there are so many resources. You heard the administrator speak to our winter ready toolkit. I recommend that you also check out the the extreme temperatures guide for local officials that we launched during our last uh, summer ready summit, which had very practical things that, that those of you who are local government officials can do to really protect your population. Because the, the truth of the matter is, we can reduce risk, we can save lives, and there's so many practical ways that, that 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 can happen from having an extreme temperature response plan to conducting a threat and hazard identification and risk assessment to planning and adapting for the future conditions that science is telling us is coming our way and has very much already arrived to adopting and enforcing building codes that are resistant to natural hazards, then things we can do to reduce human suffering are, are very, are, are, the list is long. And so really want to uh, encourage you all to check out, as the administrator said, the winterready.gov uh, ready site, look at some of those resources that we've tried to put together for you all. Also, the new Climate Risk and Resilience Portal, Climber, allows users to assess seasonal and annual temperature maximums and minimums for both high and low emission scenarios. And so there, the tools are becoming readily available to more granularly understand our risk, understand how extreme temperatures will affect us, so that in hand and glove with the communities we serve, we can do more to reduce human suffering. And so with that, I'm going to pivot to our panels, and uh, I'm going to uh, invite our interagency panel to, to join us here. And uh, we've got a, a great lineup. I'd like to kick off our, our roundtable discussion by first welcoming my colleague, Dr. Lori moore Morell, to, to, to join us. And we've got also, we're joined by Kiss, Chris Castor from the Department of Energy and Dr. Rebecca Beavers as well uh, from the Department of Transportation. And so thank you all so much for being here. I'm gonna, I have a, a couple questions for each of them. So we're gonna do a bit of a round robin and then time permitting, come back to the full, full panel. 
Dr. Uh, Lori has, was appointed by uh, President Joe Biden as the head of the U.S. Fire Administration back in October of 2021. So we started right around the same time mm-hmm. and has and has just an incredible background as the president and CEO of the International Public Safety Data Institute, which she founded. She worked for 26 years as a senior exec with the International Association of Firefighters. And she began her career in the late 80s as a, with the fire department paramedics as a paramedic in the city of Memphis. And so really has been a thought leader in, in, in uh, both in public health and data science and the confluence of that in the, in the fire management uh, in, uh, sector. So really thrilled to have you with us here today, Lori. Um, to kick us off, I, I get to see you often. So I, I, I hear you talk about the numbers of fatalities that we're facing every single year. Can you share a little bit about the magnitude of the challenges we're facing? What are those numbers? What is keeping you up at night? And and why are we seeing such an increase in the fatalities due to fire? Well, hello, first of all, Victoria, it's great to see you. And thanks so much for, for having me. Um, I'm really excited to be here and to talk about this subject. Uh, as you just said, it's very near and dear to my heart. And you just heard the secretary talk about uh, a fire death. And so what we see typically at this time of year, and it's driven by extreme cold, certainly this year, is an increase in fire fatalities across our nation. In 2023, there were about 2,300 total fire fatalities for the year. That was an average of about 6.7 a day. And already in the first three and a half weeks uh, of this year, we are over nine fatalities a day. With many of these fatalities, there are multiples. That means more than one person is dying in the fire. Four events this month, while where five children died in each of them, children under 14 is typically how we define that, four of them with five children each. Just last week, one of these was in South Bend, Illinois, and just two days ago, Alaska, where a mother and five children perished in a house fire. So these impacts of these numbers, they sound like numbers, but if you begin to think of the impact and how devastating it is, not just for those families, but for the community and for the responders who responded, the firefighters who went to those calls. So Lori, just to follow up. So we're seeing this trend. Why is it increasing? What what it what really makes the difference between something that's that is inevitable and something that is preventable in these cases? Uh, I love that question. You know, one of the largest contributing factors is heat insecurity. And and Secretary Mayorkas referred to that as well. You know, people across the nation, and it is typically our most vulnerable populations, children, the elderly, the disabled, impoverished, uh, the poor, they live without heat or without enough heat. And so they begin to use alternative heat sources. And when we've seen the temperatures that you just alluded to and the the FEMA administrator across the nation, millions of people who are now turning to alternative sources to keep warm, space heaters, open flames, cooking stoves, which we believe is a contributing factor or the cause uh, for the Alaska fire I just mentioned. And then often they'll turn to and power outages and extreme cold uh, generators for power. And so these fires that are caused by people just trying to keep warm. And I will tell you that in addition, you know, we talk about fatalities because that seems to be, you know, the one that really gets our heart, but we can't forget about those who are injured. And often those who survive these fires, they have nowhere to go because I just, you know, as I mentioned, the most vulnerable, we see our volunteer organizations come in and they have temporary solutions. But I can tell you that across this nation, there are families who as much as a year after a fire in their home due to lack of personal resources or local resources, their homes. And so this issue certainly exacerbates an already overwhelming homelessness issue in many of our communities. Thank you so much, Lori. I really appreciate that. And and really the focus on the cascading impacts of of some of the um, consequences and and the um, consequences of extreme cold. So I'm going to turn now to Chris Castro, Department of Energy. He is the Chief of Staff for the Office of State and Community Energy Programs at DOE, where he works 
works with state and local organizations to really accelerate the deployment of clean energy technologies, catalyze local economic development, create jobs, reduce energy costs. We we heard already from Lori the uh, the detrimental impacts of energy costs and how people are trying to get creative, at, unfortunately, at their own risk. And, and many other uh, and deploying place-based strategies to, to really change so many aspects of, of our society that are, um, if we don't tackle, are continuing to drive vulnerability. And we're, uh, Chris in his, his background is also senior advisor to Mary Buddy Dyer, so no stranger to local government and the challenges there, as well as the sustainability and resilience lead for the city of Orlando. So uh, such an incredibly rich background. Chris, uh, talk to us a little bit about um, the, there, there's a historic investment that DOE certainly has received a large portion of both the Inflation Re Reduction Act, bipartisan infrastructure law, and then you have all your steady state programs, whether it's weatherization and, and other things. But really, what does this mean for states and local communities? When you, when you hear what Lori's talking about and you see and you heard the administrator and the secretary, how do you see DOE really coming to the aid of of homeowners, renters, communities to solve some of these very solvable problems. Thank you, Victoria. And, and you're absolutely right. Much of what we just heard are preventable deaths that often stem from either the, the improper use or the lack of energy to stay warm or stay cold in these extreme weather events. And as you mentioned at the Department of Energy, we're managing a historic amount of new funding, nearly $100 billion dollars to support the equitable deployment of clean, reliable, secure, and resilient energy infrastructure and technology solutions, really for a wide ranging uh, group of stakeholders from governments to businesses to nonprofits, even down to the households, and to implement a wide range of strategies that help us to really make this switch, right, to a clean energy future. Uh, my office at the Department of Energy, uh, known as the State and Community Energy Programs, or SCEP, is newly formed. And it's an office that manages $16 billion of formula and competitive grants, as well as technical assistance programs with a focus on states, territories, tribal governments, local governments, community serving institutions, and even low income households. So this really is an, an unprecedented moment because thanks to these new laws, saving energy, saving money, saving lives and saving the planet are all possible and attainable for the majority of this country. Right. At DOE, not only do we have the funding, but we also have a variety of tools available to support states and local communities, including grants and prizes, new tax credits, technical assistance programs uh, and and ultimately um ways to help navigate the complexity of everything that's going on. I want to point to first a lot of our free DIY guides and toolkits that can be found on energysaver.gov. This is a full breakdown of things for the household and also the Better Buildings Solution Center, where hundreds of resources are available for our government entities to learn about case studies and best practices to drive this stuff forward. In addition, SCEP manages a huge amount of grants. I talked about 16 billion, 28 different grant programs. And one I want to highlight is what's called the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Block Grant. It's $550 million supporting over 2,700 entities with formula grants and many more with competitive grants. This helps a, a lot of different things, whether it's improving the overall resilience of the building and the efficiency, the electrification, whether it's improving the grid hardening and resilience to ensure that as these extreme weather events come, we can sustain the electric power that we have. So those are just a, a couple of examples, and, and there's so much more to be able to share here um, at the department. Thank you, Chris. And you hit on a couple of really key things. There's certainly many new resources out there, which can sometimes feel overwhelming to, to access. But you also hit on the building resources, right? I mentioned at the top of our, our time, uh, the role of building codes. And those are both hazard risk and energy efficient building codes we know save lives and, and better yes. building reduce it, reduces risk. And so great to hear about those resources, which the, the team is putting in the chat as well, so that those of you on the call can, can uh, take note more easily. One follow-up question for, for you, Chris. You mentioned so many different resources, and I think uh, every, everyone on this panel and many of you uh, listening in um, oftentimes feel overwhelmed by just how much is out there. Trying to navigate, leveraging them, utilizing them in the right way can feel very daunting. 
Um, can you speak a little bit to, I know Department of Energy is part of Thriving Communities Network and other things, like what are some of the ways you all are trying to make it simpler so that the local government and uh, state officials on the call can, can better utilize and leverage the incredible resources you mentioned? Yes, I mean, one of the early on, we realized this was going to be an issue, right? There's hundreds of opportunities here for the same stakeholders. And the question becomes how, you know, what is most relevant for me now that can help me really take the next step and, and continue our journey towards a more resilient community? We've created a one stop shop consumer savings hub here at the department that really helps primarily right now individuals navigate the tax credits and the rebates, the home energy rebates that have been made available through the Inflation Reduction Act. And so I want to point you to energy.gov slash save. That is the one-stop shop there that you can see. And I, I did also want to underscore that uh, our focus here is, in addition to just deploying clean energy, it's doing so in an equitable way and trying to get to our uh, historically disadvantaged and lowest income communities. And the Weatherization Assistance Program certainly is the premier program at the department, now over 45 years in the making, where we support upgrading the dwellings uh, and, efficient, uh, and efficiency of those units for low-income personnel. And that reduces their cost, but it also improves, improves the health and, and safety. So weatherization is certainly one that I want to encourage people to continue to, to look at. And secondly, there soon will be appliance and efficiency rebates that are going to be available by states across the country for renters and homeowners alike. And this focuses on uh, really providing upgrades to home wiring, to your H heating and, and air conditioning systems, to your water heaters using heat pump technologies, electric appliances, and more. And so, again, in addition to just your grants, there are a tremendous amount of new resources, rebates, tax credits, prizes out there. And again, going to that energy.gov slash save will really help you navigate uh, what might be best for you. Thank you so much, Chris. And and for those of you who are emergency managers on the call, um, having been in this field for a long time, I don't know that we always thought about weatherization as the frontline defense for extreme temperatures, but in many ways it is. So thank you so much for, for highlighting uh, the incredible programs that Department of Energy has, um, stitching these things all together in a way that really harnesses their value is, is obviously the, the big challenge for, for everyone, uh, but, but, a, but a solvable one. Um, I'd like to turn now to Dr. Rebecca Beavers from the Department of Transportation. Dr. Beavers is a climate policy specialist in the Office of the Secretary for the Department of Transportation, and she also represents DOT in the U.S. Global Change Research Program's Federal Steering Committee, which helped do the fifth National Climate Assessment uh, and the new National Nature Assessment. Uh, DHS and FEMA just joined last year, so we were thrilled to join you and DOT and, and, and the rest of the, the um, agencies that were already part of this. Uh, and she's been really focused on developing climate mitigation, adaptation, resilience checklists for DOT programs, conducting the DOT climate adaptation and resilience review to really look and share effect, look at and share effective strategies to address climate change and natural hazards. And she's also been part of the glue that keeps the interagency working together. She's part of multiple interagency working groups on climate change, the coastal resilience, Arctic, the Arctic and nature-based solutions, and, and including uh, regarding wildfire. And so we are thrilled to have you here today, Dr. Beavers. Thank you so much for joining us. And the question I wanted to start off with you about is we saw in the administrator's uh, backdrop, the picture she was using in her virtual background, cars on the road, trucks on the road. She referenced just kind of how people were stuck. Mm -hmm. Transfer syst transportation systems really are one of the lifelines that connect us all. Um, and they're, they're how we get to work. They, they're how we get to medical appointments how we get to take care of our, our older family members who may need our aid. So much of our life just depends on transportation. And when we hear with those messages of stay off the road uh, because of winter weather, some of us, like myself, who I, I can work from home. I have got, if, I've got, if I'm connected, I can be productive. Not everyone has that luxury. And so would really let, uh, our, my first question for you is really around how you all at the Department of Transportation are holistically thinking about transportation systems being more resilient to climate change, extreme weather, and in this case, the extreme cold and, and related effects. 
Uh, thank you so much, Victoria, and thank you to all of FEMA and the co-panelists here today for this important topic of extreme cold. Uh, the Department of Transportation's mission is to improve the quality of life for all American people and communities. This is from rural to urban, and it's also to increase the productivity and competitiveness of American workers and businesses. Each of us by products shipped on a train, a plane, a ship, or a truck, we secure the car seat in our minivan, we ride the bus or fly in an airplane to take an adventure, visit family, and to do our jobs, as you just said, um, through the unique opportunity provided by the bipartisan infrastructure law and other fund sources. DOT is improving, fixing, and creating new transportation opportunities for communities. Each of these projects is designed with climate change in mind so that when these extreme weather events, this can be the extreme cold or heat, it can be rain falling on snow, these types of events that lead to major flooding so that systems are more resilient to those changes. I think it's very important to highlight that our U.S. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg has said that as the climate crisis accelerates, more Americans are feeling the consequences in the form of extreme weather that devastates communities and destroys vital infrastructure. These types of funds will help restore critical transportation connections across the country as communities continue to repair and rebuild infrastructure damaged by extreme weather. Uh, one example of federal funding is that federal disaster de declarations will receive federal reimbursement funding through the Federal Highway Administration's Emergency Relief Program. Now, once again, these are the types of projects that need to be designed to be resilient. And it may be that it has a culvert that can include a higher discharge, recognizing these areas may be more prone to flooding with these types of rain on snow events. Another, one additional way DOT is adapting to climate change is funding research on the ways to improve and even redesign transportation systems. This is, this are, these are your ports, your roads, your airports, your bus system, even your bike lanes and sidewalks in vulnerable locations. And this includes areas from the low-lying Gulf of Mexico, where we've heard about so much of the impacts of the recent extreme cold, to the thawing permafrost below roads in Alaska. Absolutely. Those are, uh, it's, in, it's phenomenal to see and hear how DOT really has woven uh, addressing climate change mm -hmm. and, and supporting climate adaptation to so yeah. many of, of your programs. Uh, one follow-up question for, for you. Um, you mentioned kind of the, the interaction of, of both snow and rain. And, and again, for those of us, even in the D DC area, we've it was snowing last week and now it's 70 degrees and, mm -hmm. and, and muddy. Um, are there some unique considerations that you all are starting to see? You're also a climate sci uh, scientist. Are mm -hmm. there other new unique considerations that you're you're really wanting to make sure people think about as they think about transportation systems that, that maybe a decade ago weren't on our radar screen? Oh, that's such a great question. I'll highlight, yeah, it's snowing here in Colorado today. So um, a couple of the key things are so important in how communities interface with their transportation systems. We recognize that some communities do not have all of the resources they may need to um, including things such as technical assistance. So we have a program within DOT called Thriving Communities. It's a program that funds organizers. We call these these capacity builders that will provide technical assistance, planning, and capacity building to support disadvantaged and under-resourced communities. We want to enable these communities to advance transportation projects that support the community-driven economic development, health, environment, mobility, and access goals. It's really important that um, many of you on the line today take a look at the chat. And if you see this webinar later, it's DOT Navigator. So go to transportation.gov and look for DOT Navigator. This is where all of these resources that I'm mentioning today will be highlighted. Um, it's really an online resource that we've recognized so that people can go and get um, their technical assistance, but they can also link to the upcoming grant programs, whether I say programs such as RAISE, INFRA, et cetera. It's really important that we look forward and work with some of these opportunities. Um, I'll also highlight things such as the research. It's an opportunity right now. We have university transportation centers, and they've developed things such as apps to use for ice roads in the Arctic. We are really talking about extreme cold, and we've had examples come from Alaska. In those areas, the effects of even this it's the cold and warm swings that we're seeing. Yes, we may be extreme warm for a period of time and we may be extremely cold, but it's how rapidly we're going from one extreme to another. It is destabilizing 
stabilizing some of these transportation networks, such as ice roads, that are critical to many North Alaskan communities. And so it's important that apps such as this ice roads apps can help them with things such as current conditions. So if you think about the weather that you look at, if you're going to drive in rain or sun, rain or snow, um, all of a sudden you have to really look at the stability of roads in some of these very unique locations. You're, you're absolutely right. And I know we've got uh, colleagues from Alaska on, so I, I know they are probably particularly appreciating um, you speaking to some of the truly um, existential challenges when it comes to weather that that, uh, that we're ex experiencing and, and how it affects our, our daily lives. So we've got about two minutes left before we're going to transition to the next panel. So I have a lightning round of questions for our esteemed panelists. Mm -hmm. um, we have a whole range of folks on the call today, from emergency managers to nonprofit leaders to local, other local and state officials. So a lot of folks on this call want to know, what can I do now? We are in the winter season. And so my I have two questions, so you have to be quick. One is, from, from your perspectives, um, what's one thing that will make a difference this uh, year to be winter ready? And what's one seed that they should plant to be even more ready for what winter will bring next year? And I will uh, start in the order that we, we began with uh, Lori. All right. That's a tough one, Victoria. One thing. So I'm going to talk fast and do more than one. Smoke alarm batteries. I can tell you the smoke alarms, please check. If you don't have smoke alarms uh, for the EMs, go to the local fire department. You should know your fire chiefs anyway. Make sure you're checking in. There are free smoke alarm programs. Also, get out messages about close before you doze. That's the one thing. If we can teach people to put a door between them and fire until the firefighters arrive, huge. Space heaters three mm -hmm. feet away from any object, no matter what. Know your way out. Fire is fast. Absolutely, this is the messaging. We've got to get out there. You have less time now than you did 40 years ago to get out of your home if you have a fire. So we want people to have the message, make yourself savable before firefighters get there so they have time to get to you. If you can't travel on the roads, then they can't. They're having a hard time also. So buy some time, do these things, make yourself savable until they get there. Ready.gov, usfa.fema.gov slash prevention. Thank you so much, Lori. All right, Chris, take it away. Well, we can't manage what we don't measure. So for an individual, first of mm -hmm. all, let's let's look at energy audits for your home. And because of the Inflation Reduction Act, there's now a tax credit for it. It essentially waives the fee to go and understand what are the things we need to invest in our homes to be more resilient, to be safer, to be healthier and more efficient. So that's step one. Step two, for communities, tribal governments, territories looking to navigate this stuff, we actually have lifted up a new Office of Community Engagement at the Department of Energy. We're tapping into Thriving Communities Network, the Rural Partnership Network, and other interagency efforts. But if you go to energy gov slash get engaged you will see that we've organized ourselves in a re in a regional perspective so that we can support those communities with better navigating so if you have a question please come through that portal and uh that's the front door that we can help uh help you all with moving your, your efforts forward thank you so much chris and rebecca take us home Great. Uh, I mentioned DOT Navigator before. Look at those grants. Look at those opportunities. That's for your future. For your current right now, listen to the National Highway and Traffic Safety Administrations. There's a lot of guidance. Some of that has been linked here for you today. For your tires, as outside temperatures drop, so does your tire inflation pressure. Make sure each tire is filled up and to the vehicle manufacturer's recommendation when you're going to drive. Batteries. When temperatures drop, so does battery power. In cold weather, gasoline and diesel engines take more battery power to even start, and electric and hybrid vehicles' driving range can be reduced. Plan ahead with this. Also, plan your travel and your route. Check the weather, road conditions, and traffic before heading out. Don't rush these trips. Allow plenty of time to get to your destination safely. I took a kid to school this morning, and we planned ahead. We took a little extra time, and this is a kid who may be driving in a couple weeks. So have those conversations, too, with your kids. Thank you so much. I think in this quick uh, rapid fire uh, closing, it's, it is abundantly clear that there are many resources and there are many things we can do. And for those of you listening in today, many of you are the trusted messengers in the communities you serve. And so when you're the ones lifting this information up, people listen in a way that I've got to say, sometimes when it comes from us in federal agencies, 
we, we hope they listen in the same way, but many of you are the trusted messengers that can amplify and be the for force multiplier behind the incredible and important information we need to get into people's hands. So huge thank you to our federal agency panelists for being with us today. Round of a virtual applause for you all. And thanks for, for, for joining us. We are now going to shift gears and uh, we've got more incredible folks on online and I'm gonna invite up uh, our, our next panel, our state, local, tribal, territorial leaders. And we are joined this afternoon by Lynn Budd, who was appointed by the Wyoming Governor Mark Gordon as the Director of Wyoming Homeland Security and the Governor of Homeland Security Advisor in uh, back in 2019. Um, we're also going to be joined by Corey King, who is the Emergency Response for NOAA's National Weather Service in Bismarck, North Dakota, and Steve Wilson, who served as Director of Emergency Management with the Ogallala Sioux Tribe since 2016. And we'll be also joined by Sadie Martinez, who is the Colorado State Division of Homeland Security and Emergency Management, Inspector uh, Michelle Sosinski, who is with the Michigan State Police, and Seth Christensen, who is the Chief of Media Communications and Preparedness for the Texas Diver Division of Emergency Management, my, my old uh, home state. Um, and so we're going to put all of their bios in the chat so that you can uh, read about their incredible backgrounds. Um, but I, I want to spend most of our time actually talking with them versus talking about them. And so uh, we will kick off with, with Lynn. Thank you so much for, for joining us from Wyoming today. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. It is our absolute pleasure. So tell us a little bit about what is what unique strategies you have seen to snow events and 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 snow events writ large, right? We we heard in the previous panel around how we no longer live in a world where it's snow covered all winter long. Part of our new dynamic with the consequences of climate change is that it could it could yo-yo over the course of a winter season. So share with us a little bit about what you've seen uh, be successful. Uh, thanks so much, Victoria. Um, well, I have to say that our last winter was almost the exact opposite you described. It was longer, colder, wetter, more snow than anything that we've had actually since uh, 1920. Uh, we saw a, a record set for snow levels as well as cold temperatures. And in fact, that exacerbated the, the effect of the storms on us because we did not have any normal temperature changes where we would see smelting of the snow. So we had snow storm on top of snow storm. Um, so we had a tremendous amount of snow. A uh, couple of times, I, there's a couple of really innovative things that happened because of the situation. Uh, first one is uh, local emergency managers used uh, snowmobile groups to get food, water, and uh, fuel to people that were stranded or that were in a home that was in the country. You may know that Wyoming is the least populated state. We're also a very large state. So um, we have a lot of geography in between folks. They um, also uh, did a good job of uh, trying to get uh, workers to uh, fix the electrical problems that we were having. We actually used a machine called the Hagelin to transfer folks from uh, the, the machine went 150 miles on a trailer and then they rode it for 82 more miles at 40 miles an hour to take electrical repair uh, personnel to a small community of over 200 homes that had no power in sub-zero temperatures. So the creativity at the local level is just incredible. Wow, that's phenomenal. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. And, and just one follow-up follow question there. So uh, Wyoming, like many states, uh, is uh, in the winter time receives all kinds of visitors too, summer as well. But when you're having people join you all in your state who aren't residents, right? Your residents, your residents know what they're in store for, but uh, those looking for winter wonderlands who choose to go to a place like Wyoming uh, and benefit of its natural beauty, how, how do you connect with the, the transient population, the people that are there as, as visitors, because they too, you're still on the hook for helping them. Absolutely. And we do enjoy our, our visitors to our state, um, but we, a couple of things that we try to communicate to them is uh, to not trust their GPS uh, in a lot of situations. People will try to go around road closures and go down county roads that may not have a, an outage that, or a place to go that it looks like on the map. And it also may not be a passable road. We've 
taking semis out of, out of county roads, and, and that puts the first responders um, in a very tough place. We've also seen, because of the change in the ability to work from wherever you want to, uh, people moving to our state and buying their uh, two acres of paradise and enjoying it very much, which is fantastic. But they also um, don't have a lot of knowledge about how to survive in the winter and how to be what we call two weeks ready. Uh, be prepared to be on your own for two weeks so that, that when we are able to get to you, we can get to you. Thank you. And, and um, yeah, I, was, I lived in the Bay Area for a long time and there was 72 hours, but the two weeks is really important, right? You, you know at the local level or at the state level what, what preparedness means for different communities and, and what that'll take to help people achieve that level of uh, preparedness. Um, and then I'll move to uh, Corey King. Thank you so much, Corey, again, for, for being with us from uh, Bismarck. There are so many sources of weather information. We've heard already of many, um, and we're also living in a time of disinformation and, and all kinds of competing realities and people getting their information from so many different places. Um, how, how do you recommend people really sort through their choices so that they can have the best information and the information that to kind of Lynn's point, elicits the right behavior. What will help us do the right thing? Both know the right information, but do the right thing. Thanks, Victoria, for that question. And thank you for uh, having me here today. You're right. There are just a lot of different sources of information that are out there today. Um, and those sources and numbers continue to grow. And one thing that we're finding is that some of those sources can be very, very good. And as you kind of mentioned and alluded to, some of those sources aren't necessarily quite as good, especially with some of the misinformation, I'll say, that kind of gets posted out there on social media at times. Um, so I would say that the, the main thing is that everyone needs to have a reliable source of weather information. Um, once you find that reliable source, stick with that source. Uh, make sure it's one that you can trust. So when there is an impactful weather situation, extreme cold, um, a snowstorm, you name it, even in the summertime with, with extreme heat, um, you can go back to that impactful source or and ba back to your source, reliable source of information um, and, and go back to it and get that forecast. When you're doing that, we hope that NOAA's National Weather Service is at the top of that reliable resources list. And where can you do that? Well, you can find that on our webpage at weather.gov. Um, all you gotta do is type in weather.gov. And once that page pops up on your screen, you can put in your zip code. Um, that's gonna give you a weather forecast for your backyard. We also do have a social media presence. You can find your local office on social media, whether it be Facebook or X. Um, we've also got YouTube pages. Our National Weather Service headquarters does also have a uh, Instagram. So there's just a lot of great places that you can find reliable weather information. So that reliable weather information is truly at your fingertips. Um, also, we do have meteorologists working 24 hours a day, seven days a week at 122 forecast offices across the country. So we're always striving to provide the most accurate and reliable information when you need it. And I think, you know, kind of the second part of your question is people really do when you get that reliable source and you get your you get your forecast, take that information and act on it. Um, a, a forecast just kind of in, in and of itself doesn't really provide a whole lot of value just by itself. Um, but what really provides the value is when the decision makers, the community members, they take that information and they take action on it. So you hear that there's going to be an extreme event coming your way. Um, you talk to your family members, you talk to your loved ones, you pass that information along to them. That way you're being weather ready, you're helping them be weather ready and you're building a resilience for you, your family and your community. Thank you. Thank you so much, Corey. And just one follow-up question. As, as you've seen um, kind of, uh, patterns change and, and, and NOAA does an incredible job of also kind of bringing together uh, science with all kinds of science, with climate science, with behavioral science. Um, are there any trends that you want those listening today to, to know about in terms of how to communicate better about the impacts of, of weather forecast to, to change um, people's behavior? And, and I ask that because I think about even um, in our, when we were doing the summer ready, there's changes in the way we talk about heat, right? There's wet bulb heat. Like I, when I learned that some of the forecasts are assume that you're like 140 pounds and five, nine, and those aren't the right numbers, but it was basically that I'm like, which pretty sure most people in the United States of America are not that uh, demographic. But like, so my, my question really is, what, what are what are you learning? What do you want us to, how do you want people to communicate differently to really elicit the safety behaviors that you're hopeful for? 
Well, I think that, that the key is, is that once that information's out there, um, that you're able to kind of put it into a way that people can understand. It. And that's one of the things that we in the National Weather Service are really striving to do better with. Um, we've come to, come to learn that some of our technology, our, our jargon um, that, we, that we use when we talk about weather um, can, can, can be a little bit confusing. So what we've done is really focused on what we call impact-based decision support services. And that way we are able to get that information in a usable, understandable way for our partners um, and the public so they can take better action and make better decisions for their communities. So we're really focusing in on trying to kind of simplify um, the way that we communicate oftentimes when it comes to some of those weather types of events. Um, because you're right, you know, people need to be able to personalize that when, when they hear a certain weather event is going to take place, what does that mean for them, right? Um, and even in North Dakota, I'll be honest, you know, the last couple of years, we've had some uh, pretty big, you know, extreme events for even North Dakota standards. You know, we've had a couple of storms last year, I, I think back to where um, back in April of 2022, we had two very large snowstorms back to back. And that really got people's attention up here. When you're putting a, a foot or two on, of, of snow on the ground, followed by a couple of weeks later, you know, another foot or two of snow. So again, I, I think people need to think about what they're used to, um, but also prepare for things that you might not be used to. You know, if you live in North Dakota, for instance, where we are, um, you hear about snow, but when you start hearing about one to two feet of snow, that really does start to get people's attention. Well, thank you so much. And, and for those of you wondering why NOAA is on the state, local, tribal, territorial panel, uh, as, as Corey mentioned, they have local offices. Not every federal agency does such hyper local work. And so I highly recommend that you take uh, Corey up on that offer to reach out to your local National Weather Service. And, and there, there's mutual learning to be had from those of you who understand how your residents hear information better, the type of decision support tools they need. Uh, so incredible partnerships uh, opportunities there. Um, I'm going to, to move us uh, uh, to our next speaker and uh, Steve Wilson. Thank you so much for, for joining us today from the road. The uh, Ogallala Sioux tribe has been dealing, uh, is regularly dealing with cold weather, but during the week of Christmas uh, 2022, you are all were hit particularly hard with a blizzard and needed a, a major disaster um, declaration to, to support that. And this was an extreme storm that put so many lives at risk. Can you tell us a little bit about the challenges that the nation faced in the, in the immediate aftermath of that emergency response? All right, um, Steve Wilson, the Worcester Emergency Management. Um, thank you for having me on today. You know, I don't, I don't think we really come out of uh, emergency response uh, mode until we, we start hearing thunder after, after that storm came through. Um, you know, we were hit back to back by, by snowstorms um shortly after we had that uh, that first storm to come through we got hit with an arctic blast as well you know so the, the cold weather events are are really um filled with i think uh, a lot of challenges that it's not just you know a, a snow event um the, the freezing cold with the majority of homes being mobile homes that are not suited for this climate you know we're talking about minus 40 to you know, uh, minus 50 temperatures um, with wind chills about 60 to 65 uh, below zero. So you know, the, the challenges continue to happen. We, we regroup, but I think um, having a good relationship with uh, with our with our FEMA departments and a lot of our nonprofits going into kind of uh, the aftermath of that into recovery mode is is key. Having those relationships put together, um, being able to to work through a lot of um, challenges that come up, you know, day-to-day -day business does not stop when, when you're dealing with these. We're, we're still dealing with a lot of the, the challenges that we um, continue to deal with on, on a daily basis on a, on a, on a nice day. So you know, moving forward, I think after one of those, you know, we regroup, we make sure our equipment's up and running and, and get things fixed. And um, we have a really large population of uh, medical patients, dialysis, heart and cancer patients. Um, our reservation is about 3 million acres, you know, about 20 some thousand people, um, give or take a day, you know, that, that live here. So we have a large area to cover with just a couple of us in the emergency management department. So making sure that we can take care of our, our priorities first, our, um, our medical needs, our, uh, our elders, our children, 
you know, trying to get services back onto track so people can get out and, and take care of themselves. You know, it, it's really tough to, to deal with one of these cold events. So, um, and it, it does a lot, you know, hearing everybody speak today from the first panel to the second panel here now is, you know, transportation, roads, things like that get uh, damaged, I mean, severe damage. We came out of 2019 with our road infrastructure completely just about destroyed from, from the flooding, from the snows and things like that. So recovering um, from something like that on a tribal level is, is difficult with the lack of resources, funding, and the lack of resources within the departments to help re respond to that. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's an ongoing thing for any disaster, but I think the pre-planning, um, as uh, Mr. King mentioned before, um, having the local um, weather station to work with, um, there is so much misinformation out there on social media that we, we, we tell everybody, you know, we use National Weather Service from Rapid City. Please use them. That's who we use. Don't be putting on the guy from, you know, down in, in Florida who's going to talk about snow. He knows nothing about snow down there. You know, all, all due respect. But, you know, up here we're dealing with, with temperatures that are, you know, life changing. So, I mean, it's, it's really important to make sure that you have good information you know, in some pre-planning in place before you go into one of these things. We've learned some very, uh, really hard lessons uh, when I started. I've never been into emergency management. You know, I, I started and took to, you know, jumped into it. And um, there is so much information that was put out here today within the two panels. If you don't have an established program, this is, this is just like overwhelming right now, you know, to get something built. So there's a lot of tribes out there right now, even tribal nations out there with uh, um, within South Dakota, you know, that don't have an established program. We're, we're far from being established. I mean, there's so much that we need to do to be a, a fully functional emergency management program, but we stay busy continuously, uh, long hours, things like that. So it's really important, I think, for, for tribal nations to have established programs that they can dedicate to something like this because these weather events are getting worse. They're getting more and more extreme, you know, so it's, hopefully I answered some of that question there. I know no, so absolutely. No, thank you so much for that. And, and I think you also lifted up uh, some of the real complexities that we're not, we're, we're not dealing with a world in which you have a disaster, you fully recover from a disaster and you move on with life and maybe get impacted again. We're living in a world given these extremes where we've got overlapping recoveries, where we haven't even fully caught our breath and are, are getting walloped with something else. And so how we even build our infrastructure in the first place, reduce risk, adapt, all those things really need to be um, front of mind. I just had one follow-up question for you, going back to something that, that Lynn said in Wyoming, for her residents, um, two weeks, two weeks ready, right? Uh, prepared. Um, uh, I'd love to hear if you could share a little bit about how you are trying to prepare uh, your residents. What are some of the standards? What are some of the approaches? She mentioned the way they're trying to use kind of technology and new approaches to get people back on the grid. I can imagine that's even um, a more difficult situation for, for you all in some regards. But um, so what, what's the kind of, what does winter ready uh, mean right now for, for those you serve? Well, since that one, I mean, we, we've been trying to get into our districts. So, you know, we have nine districts within our reservation. And what we've done since last year is went to all nine districts with a uh, emergency operations plan for them to use within their, within their districts. Um, teaching them, you know, the basics on, on how we'd like to see a lot of these, these, these issues kind of dealt with on the district level. You know, they're, they're a separate government. They operate you know, autonomous from, from the tribal government. So, Helping them become self-sufficient is, is, is key. Helping them help help the people within their communities. We're not a typical emergency management. We're, we, we are on the ground. So, I mean, it's uh, I don't get the luxury of uh, being in the office, I guess, and, and, and doing a lot of the coordination. We actually have to get out on the ground. If I don't have a guy that can operate equipment, I have to get the equipment. So making sure that we can get out to the community, CERT program, some, you know, teaching teaching the CERT program out there, getting, getting people more aware of, of fire, you know, we talked about fire. That is a huge thing with space heaters, wood stoves with inadequate um, uh, uh, exhaust systems on those. You know, people just trying to stay warm that don't have the knowledge to. Uh, 
Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Steve. I, I really appreciate you, you sharing both your story and, and kind of perspectives and challenges. Um, Sadie, I'm going to take us to Colorado now. Um, we're, we're diving deep into the challenges that people are facing, and we've been talking a lot about uh, different kind of impacts at the, at the kind of household level as, as well as kind of the grid and systems level. What type of resource disruptions from your experience should people really be planning for that can help save lives regardless of who we are and the type of uh, emergency or disaster? This is Sadie, thank you. Um, so here in Colorado, we actually moved to a resource framework when looking at people, with looking at community members who identify as access and functional needs or a person with a disability or whatever a system may put on a label uh, um, on the community mem member. So any kind of demographic or anything like that, we are looking at what are the resources that cost lives and save lives. And with that, we've adopted the CMIST resource memory tool, uh, first introduced by June Isaacson Kale and Alexandra Enders um, after Hurricane Katrina, identifying that communication resources, maintaining health and medical resources, independence resources, support services and safety resources, and transportation resources are resources. We need to plan for um, those resource disruptions before the bad day happens. And we need to understand both as community members and systems how to talk about what those resources are versus just identifying as a person with whatever label. Because some people identify with that label and some people don't. And the ones who don't are the ones who are left behind. And so being able to think of resources as people, places, and things, and tied to my individual uh, as a community member and as a community in um, emergency management, what those resources are to be able to prepare for those resource gaps. And so that's that's what we're looking at and helping uh, a shared language because CMIST resources are universal regardless of what um, culture, regardless of what disability, regardless of what way we identify. And so it, it, it's more inclusive and universally designed. So thank you so much for that. And, and I think the, the kind of framework you're talking about makes so much sense. Um, can you kind of bring it down to kind of the tactical level for us for a second and, and even share some examples of um, where um, you've run in, where where challenges are had and how this framework was helpful or even, I mean, uh, the, I think what you're getting to as well as the importance of a shared language for identifying resource needs. Like where do you see some of the biggest disconnects and, and, um, and, and challenges and, and really understanding things in the same way? Um, it comes to, this is Sadie again, uh, this comes from uh, emergency managers are trained to look at resources and mobilize resources. Human services and public health look at it in equity, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility. Well, emergency managers haven't had that kind of training. Being able to come together and, and help emergency managers understand what do you mean when you say AFN or access and functional needs or a person with a disability? What that means is what are the actual resources I need in order to function when the bad day happens? And if I can know what that is together and learning together and planning together, we could learn from people with lived experience on what a solution resource could be. And so we're a bunch of good people trying to do good things. We just don't know what we don't know. And one of the two of the examples where this came in very uh, strongly was during we had a bomb cyclone in 2019 and um, a state emergency operations center was activated. And it was reported to me that 900 people with AFN were affected. And right away I went, OK, what does that mean? Does that mean people need access to communication, maintaining health or medical uh, independence, support services, safety, or transportation. Come to find out, the community affected were people who needed the information in a language 
that they best understand. So in a different language is what the, the portion was there. The other example was during COVID when uh, our mission was to reach as much vulnerable population as uh, and to save life and property. And I was like, what's the, what, what, what do you mean by vulnerable population? I never heard anybody identify as I'm vulnerable population. So I started looking at what was the resource needed. And at that time, it was personal protective equipment. So a maintaining health um, resource. And so I was able to work with the governor's office, our team, and we were able to identify how to resource mobilize to ensure that people with disabilities were not left behind and others who are uh, people who, who were ident uh, who needed some of that maintaining health re resource as well. So thank you for that wonderful question. Yeah, no, thank you so much, Sadie. And you're really, I think, getting to the heart of the difference between equity and equality. Equality meaning giving everyone the same thing, giving it out equally, and equity really getting to getting people the support they uniquely need. And that's a lot harder, but it actually is what solves the problem. So thank you for, for lifting up um, the work you'll, you all are doing in Colorado. I'm going to now move us to uh, Michigan, to uh, Michelle Sosinski, uh, my, my husband's home state. I have to say go blue. I'm not sure what your affiliation is, but I've been trained. Um, so what are some of the resources available through the Michigan State Police to assist during cold weather emergencies at the local level? Good afternoon, and thank you, Victoria, for, for asking me to be on. I do have to say um, this is go Lions time for <laughs> pretty much this whole state, and it sounds like the rest of the country or a lot of the country, so I'm um, happy to say that. Um, first of all, the I'd like to say um, I, I know we're talking about a lot of gaps and a lot of things that um, a, a lot of... Um, disparity, but I would like to say that I think our residents and local emergency management programs have a ton of resiliency. Uh, we get a lot of snow and cold weather uh, in this state, and we really only have pockets of areas where the state is asked to assist. So uh, Michigan's emergency management and homeland security is uniquely housed within the Michigan State Police. So we're only one of two states in the nation that um, are housed in that way. There are many benefits to this, of, uh, one of which is instant access to many resources as we work to assist local emergency management programs. I just wanna highlight uh, a few of those. One is a direct link um, that, that we have between us and the local emergency management programs. We have eight district coordinators in the field. They are all uh, state police lieutenants who are in regular and direct contact with the local emergency managers. And it's during all phases, uh, not just during the response or during the emergency, but um, preparation and planning. We um, even at the state level, we meet with them uh, on a monthly basis, um, easy to do with the technology that we have now. Uh, when our state emergency operations center is activated, it brings all state agencies and partners together to provide support and resources and assist in any unmet needs. For extreme cold weather emergencies, like what we're talking about today, our partners uh, tend to include uh, Michigan Department of Transportation, obviously, Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, uh, National Weather Service, our energy companies, uh, specifically Consumers Energy and DTE Energy are our uh, main providers here in Michigan, uh, American Red Cross and Michigan 211, we rely heavily on to, um, to help us in spreading and communicating and collecting information for us. Another resource that we have is that any local program can proactively create an incident in Michigan's uh, WebEOC, our uh, Michigan Critical Information Management System, or MySIMS is what we call it. Uh, once an incident is created, this activity log provides a direct line of communication between stakeholders and uh, responders at the local level. So they can add to an activity log, they can make requests to the state, and of course, it's it's all a way of, of gaining and, and continuing to have uh, situational awareness. That's great. Additionally, whoop, sorry. No, no, please go ahead. Funny. Additionally, dot, dot, dot. Yeah, sorry. Additionally, um, MSP has flown winter tra 
traffic crash pileups with our unmanned aircraft system, our drone technology, our, our state police choppers are available to collect video. And that information is used to um, build interactive story maps that's, that are created by our, by our GIS team, which are housed with us in emergency management and homeland security. So that is very helpful. We have a lot of um, proactive public information that we push out on a regular basis, preparedness tips ahead of the weather coming, really has seemed to help us over these last few years. Um, news releases, social media, um, a lot of interviews, and then we start right off in November with Winter Hazards Awareness Week, a campaign that um, provides toolkit information and, and getting people every year, even though they live here, thinking about, um, you know, what hazards could be coming. Um, there is a ton of coordination between state agencies, uh, lots of messaging um, coming together and kind of trying to be one voice that comes out either together as the, um, you know, through the, whether it's through the state emergency operations center or even individually, we try to do our best to, to work together. Thank you. I have just one quick follow-up question for you. You described such a plethora of information and collaboration between agencies. Uh, we also know, I think, looking across the nation that um, we oftentimes uh, hear least from the most underserved communities. How are you all, um, how are you finding ways to really make sure that even if you're not getting that 211 call or um, there's not the incident report that the, the folks most at risk, folks like we heard other speakers talk about, um, are, are getting the support they need in these difficult times? Good question. Uh, we do rely heavily on the local emergency managers to help us with that. Um, a lot of times with preliminary, preliminary damage assessments, when we're out, when we are trying to assess what kind of um, um, emergency or, or what, how much damage has really occurred, we're going door to door. We're not just relying on those that are calling 211 and saying that they have damage. We are um, making sure that we're going to um, their next door neighbor and their next door neighbor to make sure that there isn't also damage that way. Um, but we really do rely heavily on our locals to help us with the messaging in all different formats. So not just technology or waiting for them to call, but reaching out to them as well. Thank you so much, Michelle. All right. Uh, Lone Star State, Seth Christensen. Uh, well, question for you here. You all have dealt with so much in Texas as 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 my home state and as uh, par having parents in Austin. Um, you all have been dealing with so much in, in Texas, major swings, major extreme cold events. Um, with, with the kind of experience you have under your belt over even the last several years, how are you, uh, what are you doing differently to encourage people to plan ahead for extreme cold? What, what's shifting for you all and how are you accomplishing that goal? Yeah, thanks, Victoria, and thanks for the opportunity to be on with y'all today. Um, you know, I, we are no stranger to disaster in Texas, as you mentioned, but I think that it's very important just to take it back to the basics. I think that all too often, we as emergency management personnel tend to overcomplicate what we do, or even what we ask our uh, constituents that we serve to do. Personal preparedness is key, and as government officials, I think we need to be prepared to respond as well. But um, personal preparedness, and on, on that front, I think we need to remind our citizens that it is important that just as we do in government, that they need to make a plan, make a personal preparedness plan, and be ready to exercise that plan, and then implement that plan when disaster strikes. We do that every day in government, and our citizens should be doing the same thing on their end as well. We make emergency management plans, we train and we exercise to those plans, and then when disaster strikes, we are ready and we implement those plans. Um, I think that the uh, Texans or constituents across the country should utilize resources that are provided by government officials and by our media partners, such as our meteorologists. Um, Ready.gov has a ton of great information. In Texas, TexasReady.gov is a great place um, to find uh, resources um, to make your plans and to, to help you out in the event of a disaster. Um, sign up for local alerts. Get those key messages from government officials that are closest to you from your local officials build an emergency supply kit. And then if you, use that, if you use that emergency supply kit during a disaster, restock that uh, supply kit after a disaster. Specifically in Texas, um, one of the things that we created after uh, Hurricane Harvey 
is a TDM, the TDM disaster portal. This is a portal on our TDM homepage that is a one-stop shop for key resources for Texans. During extreme winter events, it might include a warming center map, um, such as is found at tdm.texas.gov slash warm. During the summer, those turn to cooling centers. These are places that we identify resources that local officials have opened and are available to Texans. And then we put those and we compile those on our website so that Texans can, can find, find those at a one-stop shop. We even have during extreme winter weather, you know, um, we might have uh, pipes that are frozen and then they thaw out and you, could, you people are finding that their pipes have been broken in their homes. So we even have compiled a licensed plumber's map on our website so that people can find access to those resources in a one-stop shop. Um, additionally, our state of Texas emergency assistance registry, um, the STEER registry, this is for people with disabilities or functional and access needs um, to make local first responders in their communities aware ahead of the event of where they might live, what their needs might be, and so that when disaster strikes, those local first responders are able to um, identify those places where they might have um, residents in need, and they're able to respond uh, uh, appropriately to serve those citizens. Well, wow, so many incredible resources. And um, Seth, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw you a so your second one's a softball, but I, I have an assumption here. Um, you have invested so much as TDEM and people go to you all to like learn about your like your academies, your websites. Um, if, if somebody listening here today was like, oh my gosh, just some information is amazing. Uh, are you guys generally open to having people borrow and adapt your, your great work? 100%. Um, TDEM.texas.gov is where all of our information lives. If you want to find any information on there, steal that information, use it, utilize it as a best practice. Um, Texas wants and is, I believe, one of the leaders in emergency management, not only across the nation, but around the world. And so um, we are 100% happy for people to utilize any information that they see. And if we can do things better, we're always willing and ready to learn from them as well. Thank you so much. So a couple of themes that I want to uh, tee up from, from this panel conversation as we reach the top of the hour. Um, I think we heard Lynn and uh, you, you, you really hit home the importance of um, both, I think, Lynn and Steve, just what it means to be clear with your communities, what preparedness looks like, what there there's, when you can have a mutual expectation to have it, but also and to be clear about it, but then also to really lift up resources. And we heard Sadie talk about this. Not everyone can be prepared for two weeks. When I was living, when I was the chief resilience officer in Oakland, preparedness for folks who are living in affluent areas looks different than, than what people can do in less affluent areas. And so part of making sure everyone is winter ready is making sure we're meeting people where they're at. We also heard about so many great resources and a willingness for people to share. There's already learning taking place, peer-to-peer -peer learning is, is known to be one of the most powerful ways to, to help each other move forward. Seth, Seth has already offered that if you see something on the TDEM website that you just would like to, uh, to, to copy, uh, that, that they are welcome to do that, that being a thought partner is, is part of their ethos. And just so many very practical tips from Michelle, from Corey, from, from everyone. And so hopefully today's conversation has really brought to life some very tactical things we can do to be winter ready this winter season, but also we heard from our federal panelists as well uh, and from uh, this panel, things that take a little bit more time. They take an investment of energy, of resources, but they have a major dividends for your resilience in the winter season. And so I wanna thank all of our panelists for, for really joining us here today, taking time out of, of your busy schedules, but, and also very importantly, all of you who listened in, hopefully you are taking something with you today. Again, there will be a write-up from, from today's session that captures many of, of the resources that were listed. So if you're trying feverishly to write things down, they will be captured, they will be sent out. There will be a YouTube channel. Uh, the FEMA YouTube channel will, will have this video so you can share with others and, and go back to anything you, you might've missed. But really, as the administrator said, uh, we have, this is, uh, she, she really is calling for this to be the year of resilience. Many people think FEMA and they think disaster response recovery. Many of you on the call who are emergency management professionals, they, you get looked at and people think emergency response, emergency recovery. Resilience is truly how we're going to change the course of our trajectory and manage all of these threats and hazards that we're, we're dealing with in, in new and extreme ways. And so the goal is for through our partnerships, through conversations like this, through the follow-up, through, through the hard work that comes beyond, uh, that, that, that keeps on coming to really make sure that we're able 
to understand risk, prepare, adapt, withstand, and recover from the adversity so that we are together reducing human suffering. That is truly what it's all about. And I want to thank uh, our panelists here today for sharing very concrete ways that we can achieve just that. So again, uh, plenty of resources, including our Winter Ready Toolkit and the, the Local Officials Guide on Extreme Temperatures that we put out last year, and so many other resources that were lifted up today. So thank you all so much. And again, thank you to Secretary Mayorkas and Administrator Chriswell for kicking us off and to all of our attendees. I, I hope you've heard actionable steps and that you can implement these ideas in your own organizations. Have a wonderful rest of your Friday and a safe and relaxing weekend. Take care.